this computer. Right, so we've, uh, we're live. Over to you, Dan. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Brian. Uh, thank you to yourself and also to your colleagues at Projects. And again, thank you to I'm a Key West Yorkshire for inviting us back to deliver what is the eighth of our suite of uh, CPD presentations. Um, as you know, we've delivered seven presentations previously across the range of uh, steam and condensate system design. Um, and today's presentation, uh, Steam, What the Future Holds, uh, has been hastily cobbled together over the past few weeks uh, as a specific request from a number of um, IMAKI members. Uh, and they really asked the question, um, it's all well and good, Dan, talking to us about steam traps and talking to us about steam boilers. Is steam really going to be relevant in 20, 25 years time in the light of the current challenges that were being faced in the, uh, the energy crisis and so forth? Uh, and the answer is yes, STEAM is still going to be relevant. And hopefully this presentation will give you a little bit of food for thought with regards to how uh, both the generation and the utilization of STEAM is starting to change shape in order to address those challenges. So we've introduced ourselves here in the UK on a number of occasions now. Um, hopefully I don't need to go through that again in too many details. Uh, suffice to say that um, as far as Spire Asako UK is concerned, we've got a very powerful suite of calculators and configurators that you guys can download to your smartphone in the form of an app. And that will help you not only with understanding the various design considerations that you need to take on board, but it will also help you to calculate not only the cost of a unit of steam, but it will also help you to understand how and where cost savings with regards to energy efficiency improvements and therefore reducing carbon emissions can be realized and brought about. So when we're talking about steam and looking towards the future, we need to understand that we've spoken previously about optimizing existing steam networks. That's what we looked at um, last week when we specifically discussed how we could uh, bring about an increase in condensate recovery. We could minimize flash steam emissions and so forth. Um, and what we need to bear in mind is that existing or traditional steam systems they were likely developed, designed, installed at a time way before climate change was even a consideration. So today we're gonna to be looking at a few uh, conceptual uh, solutions that are currently at an advanced stage of development uh, down at our research facility in Cheltenham. And we're gonna look at how a lot of these concepts are going to take a traditional steam system to the very next level and therefore be in a position to address all of the challenges that we're likely to face in the coming years. So I just wanna emphasize that tonight it's a conceptual rather than a technical presentation um, because those products are still at an early stage of development, but hopefully they're gonna give you an idea of uh, many of the things that are happening at the moment to ensure that steam is still very much a relevant source of, uh, of energy. So we're going to look at not only the challenges that industry is currently facing, many of us are already going to be familiar with those challenges, but we're going to look at how we can improve upon traditional good working practice to design new steam systems or um, to optimize an existing steam system in order to ensure that we can realize those energy and carbon reduction objectives. So another slide I want to put up uh, at this moment is I've introduced Spirax Sarko in the UK on a number of occasions now, but I just want to reiterate that Spirax Sarko as a group, it really consists of three different divisions. So first of all, we've got the steam specialties division that comprises Spirax Sarko and also a brand called Gestra. We work very closely with steam. But we've also got another of, of companies that work in what we refer to as our electrical thermal solutions division, Chromalox and Thermos. And the marriage between these, uh, these two distinct divisions helps us to not just talk about steam, but talk about thermal energy. And we're now in a position where we can move towards 
um, utilizing the technology and the knowledge and experience that our electrical thermal solutions division has to, uh, to, to, to research different ways that we can generate steam from alternative sources. So as you can see on the on the screen, um, we are a large global entity. So we do have a significant um, research and development budget that enables us to look towards the future and to help us to address the challenges that we expect to see in the coming years. So we've spoken previously about the diverse range of applications where steam is used. And that can range all the way from uh, humidification in a pharmaceutical clean room, sterilizers in a hospital, hot water in a university, to uh, cooking uh, product through direct steam infusion. There's a whole range of very, very diverse applications where steam is used. So we need to bear that in mind. We're not just talking about uh, steam as a source of domestic, uh, as a source of producing domestic hot water or heating for building service applications. Um, while steam is very, very efficient in producing hot water and steam uh, for building service applications, it's really the arena where we're using that source of thermal energy at higher temperatures and pressures that we're really looking at today. So, of course, we know that the government produced a, a white paper recently um, where the government really reiterated their goal for industry in general to see a 90% reduction of the year 1990s emissions by 2050. So we need to bear in mind that that target, that goal, is just 29 years away. And moving forwards, like many other consumers of energy, we as a FTSE 100 company recognise that we've got a corporate responsibility. We have to have a robust sustainability policy. And like many others, we've given ourselves an even more challenging deadline uh, to achieve our own goals. Uh, and we recognize that we need to do the same to help our clients to achieve their respective goals. They're likely to have goals and targets that are more aggressive than the government has laid out. So the sooner we can start our transition to using thermal energy more sustainably, the sooner we can all realize our individual and collective challenges. The bottom line is that this problem that industry as a whole has got, it's not going away. So when we look at those, those key sectors, I've just chosen four, four key sectors where steam is used in um, a wide range of applications here. Of course, we appreciate that the use of steam uh, applies across multiple sectors. But when we're looking at the likes of food and beverage, pharmaceutical, chemical, pulp and paper, we know that the vast majority of industrial applications have got a requirement to use thermal energy or steam at temperatures way in excess of what low temperature hot water can provide. And that means it's putting that requirement beyond the reaches of air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. And of course, air source and ground source heat pumps are widely promoted at the moment. And they're perfectly acceptable for domestic hot water or building service applications that utilize that thermal energy at lower temperatures. But for, that, for the vast majority of industrial applications, it basically means that there isn't currently any alternative to the use of thermal energy at higher pressures and higher temperatures. And therefore, Industries such as this are always going to have a requirement for using steam. So we just need to be more innovative about how we generate steam, control steam and distribute it and also how we use steam. So I just want to take a look at the key principles very, very quickly. I've gone on a number of occasions now, but it bears repeating because we've got to understand the fundamentals. We've got to understand the first principles of uh, steam engineering before we can come on to understand how and why these new conceptual solutions have got a place. So the, uh, the, the, the key piece of information that remains fundamental is the understanding that 
the specific heat capacity of water, which is the raw ingredient of a steam system, and it's a key component of that condensate, it's got a specific heat capacity of 4.19, which we've mentioned previously. So as we can see in the box in orange, uh, the pressure and the temperature determine how much energy we need to put into the water to bring it up to boiling point. We refer to that as the, as the sensible heat. Basically, it's how much energy we need to put into that water to get it to the point before it can change state to steam. And we know that that gives us boiling water, but we know that we need to put further heat energy into that water to make it change state to a gas, to steam. We refer to that as the latent heat or the enthalpy of evaporation. And again, as you can see in the box that's highlighted in blue here, the amount of energy we need to put into that boiling water to make it evaporate will change in accordance with the pressure that we're generating and distributing that steam at. And we've also mentioned previously that we know that steam carries this combination of the latent heat and the sensible heat. We refer to that as the total heat. So the total heat is carried towards the process, the heat exchanger, but we know that when that steam condenses, when it gives up its heat energy, we know it's actually the latent heat, the box in blue, that's the heat energy that travels across the thermal barrier and into the process. So what that actually means is the energy that's left behind in that liquid condensate, well, it's the same as the sensible heat that we put into the water to bring it up to boiling point in the first place. So let's just remind ourselves about that pressure temperature relationship. We know that if there's a direct temperature pressure relationship with both the steam and the condensate, and we know that when steam condenses, it gives up its latent heat energy, but it doesn't give up any temperature. So we can see that if we know the steam pressure, well, we know the temperature. For example, if we're generating steam at the boiler at 10 bar gauge, well, that's going to exist at a temperature of 184 degrees. But when steam condenses in the distribution pipe work, especially if it's wet steam, that condensate that exists in the distribution pipe work, it's going to exist at the same temperature and at the same pressure. It's just a different phase. It's a liquid as opposed to gas. But we know that we reduce the pressure of the steam at the process. We do that for a number of reasons. We reduce the pressure at the process. For one, it means that we're able to keep the steam as dry as possible. We're able to minimize the distribution losses. We're able to distribute it at a higher pressure. We're able to control the temperature of the steam by manipulating the pressure. So if we've reduced the pressure down to two bar gauge, 132 degrees, well, the condensate is also reduced down to two bar gauge, 132 degrees. Therefore, we know that whenever we get a falling condensate pressure, we need a fall in temperature. And therefore, we know that we're going to get a release of energy that results in that flash steam that we've spoken about on so many occasions. Now, the flash steam is a change. It's not just a change of phase from a liquid to a gas. It's a change of energy. It's a change of energy from sensible heat back to total heat, meaning that there's just as much heat energy in flash steam as there is in plant steam. We either need to reduce and control the production of flash steam, or we need to find a way to recover it in some way. And one of the reasons that that flash steam is so often vented away and lost is because as we get the change of state from liquid condensate to steam as a gas, we know we've got that huge increase in volume. So just to remind ourselves, if we're generating steam and distributing steam at a pressure of 10 bar gauge, well, we know that that's gonna have a volume slightly below 0.177 cubic meters. But then again, if we've reduced the pressure of the steam at the process from 10 bar gauge to two bar gauge, we know that the volume is going to be considerably larger. But we also know that when steam gives up its latent heat, 
we're left with that sensible heat in the condensate. And that's going to exist at the same temperature and the same pressure as the steam itself. So when the condensate falls in pressure, when it passes across a steam trap, for example, that release of excess energy is being converted from sensible heat back to total heat. That's what's going to result in that phase change. And that huge expansion is one of the reasons why we so often need to vent that flash steam away, at which point it becomes lost because it's vented to atmosphere. So one of the first things I want us to do is to consider how steam is generated. Now, one of the very first presentations we went through looked at the fundamentals of steam and the fundamentals of steam generation in a traditional shell and tube, fire tube boiler. And this is traditionally done using fossil fuels, coal in years gone by, more recently, oil and gases, which, which we know the burning of those fossil fuels, it's going to result in significant carbon emissions. And that's what we know that industry is currently under the spotlight for. So the unfortunate thing for us as engineers is that there are so many engineers uh, and industry experts in general they so closely associate steam and fossil fuels to the extent that they become one and the same. Because fossil, because steam is generated using fossil fuels, they equate that with steam being dirty and inefficient. And that's not the case. It's just the fuels that have traditionally been used to generate steam that are. The short answer is, well, we need to think creatively. We need to find another way to generate steam efficiently and by minimizing, if not completely eliminating those carbon emissions. So one particular technology that's in um, development at the moment is the use of hydrogen burners to retrofit to existing steam boilers to generate steam. Well, we know that at the moment today, 95% of all steam is currently produced from natural gas. And we also know that there's a lot of UK funding at the moment. You just need to read those white papers that are out there. There's a lot of funding and there's a lot of projects currently looking at how here in the UK, we can move towards hydrogen as being a preferred and alternative source of energy. And as far as steam's concerned, well, we know that hydrogen's clean burning. Basically, when we burn hydrogen and oxygen together, the byproduct is water vapor. So there's no harmful emissions and therefore there's no uh, carbon uh, dioxide, carbon monoxide, any other source of gases to give thought to as a result of that combustion byproduct. So hydrogen and steam have got a very, very good fit because hyd hydrogen could potentially be distributed in the same natural gas infrastructure. I say potentially uh, because at the moment there's some debate whether or not hydrogen is suitable for being distributed in the traditional uh, cast iron pipe work compared to the more modern yellow MDPE pipe work. So that puts a question mark over the distribution network itself. So if hydrogen is available locally to the steam using site and the boiler house itself, then it would simply be a case of retrofitting new burners onto an existing steam boiler. But even if there wasn't a hydrogen network available locally, then hydrogen could potentially be used on site using renewables to electrolyze water, and it could then be combusted to produce steam in exactly the same way. Uh, the real question at the moment is, is hydrogen, uh, is the production of hydrogen A available and is it B going to be financially viable? And that's what a lot of the research is looking into at the moment. Now, at the start of the presentation, I introduced one of our uh, sister companies that falls under the Spirox Sarco engineering banner. And that's a company called Chromalox that we acquired back in 2017. Chromalox have got a lot of solutions at the moment that look at um, using power to generate thermal energy. In other words, electricity to steam. Think of it as a, a very sophisticated but oversized kettle, if you will. 
So some of the benefits of using electrical steam generation is, well, first of all, there's no open flame. So that's going to be, that's going to have a, an enhanced level of safety when it comes to operating um, the generator for the simple reason that we're not susceptible to getting uh, an overpressure or a failure of the boiler pipes on uh, on a, on an on an over temperature basis if we get a, a, a fault with the uh, a traditional uh, flame tube that collapsing tube can result in a catastrophic failure of the boiler and that's what a lot of the traditional uh, blowdown controls and water level controls on a traditional boiler are there to prevent we also know that a traditional fossil fuel burner utilizing gases or oil, we know that that's going to operate at around about 85% efficiency at the, at the upper end as a maximum. But we know that because uh, an electrical burner um, is fully immersed within the water in the generator, it can operate at near 100% efficiencies. So a traditional steam boiler a traditional burner utilizing fossil fuels well that's that's sized and the efficiency is based on a number of different assumptions such as the percentage load of the boiler uh, the steam demand uh, the, the cycling the seasonal variation loads the buildup of scale and the buildup of soot on the nozzles of the of the burner itself and they're also sized on a full load assumption therefore the overall efficiency of the of the burner and the boiler is going to fall whenever demand for steam falls. And we also know that traditional burners, they're also going to require uh, an air blower, and that's going to come with an additional burden of maintenance and an additional cost. So if we move away from a traditional fossil fuel burner uh, towards an electrical generator, that doesn't have any soot or any ash or emissions testing requirements. We know we've got less downtime. We know they need less supervision, less inspection, less testing. We know that it's easier to, to fully automate. And that's largely down to the fact that it'll have zero moving parts. So of course, these can all bring around significant benefits for our steam using client. And a medium voltage system um, that's an ideal solution for applications that are greater than 879 kilowatts. That's around about 1,600 kilograms per hour, which is relatively small by traditional steam boiler standards. So it's really just a question of ensuring that the appropriate direct connect, that's the trademark, it's just ensuring that the appropriate direct connect electrical heater is selected to match the required steam mass output of the process so an electrical generator well it can be very easily incorporated into an existing steam boiler house to replace a traditional fossil fuel fired steam boiler as it can use the same infrastructure we can use the same pipe work and the water treatment requirements the tds levels permitted by the boiler are very very similar to a traditional steam boiler in other words we can use the same water treatment plant one of the problems we've got here is it really depends upon the cost of electrical energy compared to um, gas now in some parts of the world um, electricity uh, and gas are very very similar in other parts of the world, the cost of electricity uh, far outstrips the cost of gas. So we need to give thought to whether or not our client is likely to be utilizing electrical energy straight from the grid or whether they've got a, a cost effective uh, alternative source of renewables locally to site. But as we mentioned, electrical steam generation, it still requires a considerable electrical or a considerable power load. And whilst this is going to have a significant benefit to our clients in reducing CO2, for example, we can take that one step further. And we can take that one step further with the solution that you can see on the screen at the moment. This is what we refer to as the thermal store. And the thermal store can further reduce an electrical demand while still raising steam efficiently. So we can use the we can use the electrical energy, the power, either from the grid or from renewable sources, and we can use that to charge a mass of water. 
under pressure. In other words, we're bringing that water up to temperature whilst it's under pressure. So it's still in a liquid phase here. So if you remember the basics of the steam fundamentals that we looked at earlier in the slide, well, if we depressurize that hot water, we're gonna get that flash steam being produced. And remember, there's just as much flash steam, there's just as much energy in flash steam as there is in plant steam. So we can use that flash steam in exactly the same way that we would do the plant steam on a traditional system to satisfy the demand by the process. So this works, for those of you that are familiar with the concept of steam accumulators, it works in exactly the same way with the benefit of the fact that it's, it's self-charging. We're charging that stored water with electrical power rather than with an excess of, of plant steam. Now this works very, very well because it utilizes 100% of the power that is available to site. So that's all well and good when we're talking about new innovations when it comes to generating steam. Remember, we've got the hydrogen burners, we've got the electrical steam generation, and we can also move towards a thermal store. Well, when it comes to using steam at the process, we've mentioned that many processors uh, need to utilize steam at higher temperatures and higher pressures. And that's where we know that the condensate is going to exist at equally high temperatures and pressures. But it may well be that we've got a source of effluent that exists at an equally high temperature or pressure. So what we need to really do is look at ways that we can not only utilize the steam and the condensate more efficiently, but we want to look at ways that we can utilize the waste heat as well. And that's where one of our products that we call the control phased cycle or the CPC for short has really got its place. So we know that a lot of industrial processes reject a significant amount of waste heat in the form of effluent. And this effluent's often going to be at temperatures that are lower than most traditional methods of heat recovery can make use of. So one of the problems is that not only is this a waste of heat energy, but quite often that waste heat has then also got to go through some additional form of cooling before it can be discharged to waste. Maybe that's got to pass across a cooling tower. So if we look at a traditional organic ranking cycle, that's traditionally going to recover the heat that's available, but only when it's in excess of 120 degrees. So the, tr the, the modern innovative controlled phase cycle or CPC, that can now make use of the heat energy that is going to exist at significantly lower temperatures. We can, we can take waste heat from temperatures as low as 70 degrees, but obviously the, the higher the, 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 the waste temperature stream, the greater those returns are going to be. So a CPC, it's basically a skid mounted solution and it takes its temperature from the effluent stream and it causes a phase change of uh, refrigerant on, on the secondary side of the heat exchanger. And this refrigerant is basically an expanding gas. As it expands, it turns a turbine to generate a small amount of electrical energy. And then the gas is then cooled and condensed. And then the cycle continues and the cold effluent or the effluent that's been reduced in temperature is then passed to waste and the electrical energy just goes into the, uh, into the local network. So the cost benefit is measured, it's partly in terms of the electricity generated, but it's partly in terms of the cooling cost saving there. And it's particularly interesting as this particular solution is guaranteed that 100% of the waste heat will be utilized. But I just want to show you a very quick video or animation that's it's probably going to explain the concept of the CPC a little bit more clearly um, than I've done. So just bear with one moment while I uh, while I press play of this little video.
Okay, thank you. Hopefully that uh, that little video played for you, and hopefully if it did, it made sense. So the key benefit to a CPC is uh, reducing cooling costs and providing a small amount of electrical energy. So the key benefits are really going to be realised by sites that have got um, a reasonable temperature and a reasonable uh, mass of effluent that is potentially being put to waste. So moving forward, um, we've also got another challenge uh, that we're addressing at the moment. That's regards to the digitalization of our clients' overall steam and condensate loop. There's a huge opportunity here. It ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of stakeholders on our client's site. So when we think about a traditional steam system, the processes are capable in many cases of sending a signal back from control valves, steam traps, um, variable speed drive pumps, boiler controls, flow meters, etc., to a variety of PLC or BMS systems for, for diagnosis on site. But if we can move towards a digitally enhanced system, all of these components and controls will be capable of interacting with each other and then sending that information over a cloud-based storage system that can be received off-site to third-party stakeholders potentially anywhere in the world. So there are a number of key benefits here for our clients. For one, it means that there's a huge benefit because if we're able to identify and diagnose a problem quite often we may be in a position where we're able to diagnose an issue not only with the process but also with a wider steam distribution network that could be an issue with steam quality um, energy inefficiency process time quite often we've been in a position to diagnose a problem before the client was even aware of it themselves Whereas traditionally, it may, be, may take a, a significant period of time until a client was aware of an issue. They would then traditionally call in um, a sales engineer to diagnose the problem, who may then need to call in a service engineer to rectify the problem. By moving towards a digitally enhanced network, not only would we be able to assist the client to identify, diagnose a problem in real time, we may also be in a position to help the client rectify the problem themselves. And it also means we've got a different, um, different resources, different tools available to help the client to do that. It's not reliant on the traditional face-to-face -face site visit. So we still need to emphasize that all of the solutions and new technologies that we've, that we've gone through it assumes that we've already really taken account of the basics. It assumes that we've already um, uh, ensured that all of those concepts that we've discussed in previous presentations have already been taken into account. It's like uh, putting brand new tires on, um, uh, on a car that simply isn't firing on all cylinders. We've got to ensure that we've got the basics right before we move to incorporate those modern and efficient technologies. So I'm talking about uh, basic solutions such as ensuring that the steam traps are fully operational, auditing the steam traps periodically. Better still, moving towards a system where we can send a signal to a remote BMS to monitor the steam trap operation. It's important that we keep the hot well at a nice high temperature. Remember that rule of thumb, keeping the temperature of the hot well at around about 85 degrees and ensuring that we're recovering approximately 80 to 85 percent of all of the condensate that is generated across site. If the hot wells at a lower temperature, it's an indication that not only are we losing water, we're losing a significant mass of uh, energy as well. We also want to ensure that we're observing um, uh, good working practice to recover as much of the condensate as we possibly can to ensure that we don't have the pumps in a cavitated or failed position and to ensure that we don't have significant amounts of condensate being lost through the vent wherever there's that pressure drop in the condensate. Good working practice to ensure that we're keeping the steam as dry as possible, ensuring that it can drain out of the distribution network to the steam traps quickly 
and ensuring that we're fitting separators at the appropriate key points to dry the steam. Those key points immediately behind the steam boiler where we get a fluctuation in pressure, temperature and we get wet steam being produced immediately ahead of the process and also ahead of any capital equipment to protect it. The drier the steam, the more energy there is present in it. Ensuring that the insulation is kept at the optimum standard to reduce the heat losses in the distribution pipe work. Ensuring that we've upgraded the boiler blowdown controls, ensuring that we've moved away from manual blowdown to automated blowdown to ensure that that energy that needs to be lost and purged to waste to keep the energy at an optimum point, ensure that it's kept at the lowest point prescribed by the OAM. Any more is an inefficiency. But also ensuring that that flash steam that is vented away to atmosphere to protect the condensate system and to protect the condensate pumps to ensure that it's kept to an absolute minimum or better still to ensure that we've got solutions in place to recover it. Now, there's one such solution that we have spoken about previously. We've spoken about a traditional atmospheric hot well before. Uh, and that's where we know that we can only contain the feed water at atmospheric pressures, zero bar gauge, meaning we can only hold the water at 85 degrees. So that means that quite a lot of the flash steam will still be lost in the boiler house itself to protect those pumps from cavitation. So if we've got a loss of flash steam, it means we've got going to experience a significant loss of not only energy, but we're reducing the amount of condensate that is going to be returned to the feed tank itself. So we've spoken about the benefits that we can enjoy by moving towards a system where we can keep the feed water under pressure in a pressurized deaerator. So if we're elevating the pressure to 0.2 bar gauge, we can elevate the temperature to 105 degrees or, or thereabouts. So we've got a significant number of benefits here. For one, a higher pressure, that equals a higher temperature. So the boiler is going to respond more rapidly whenever there's a demand for steam. For two, it means we're going to be placing less stress, less thermal fatigue on the boiler. If we're putting hot water into the boiler, as opposed to putting water that's slightly colder into the boiler. For three, well, we're consuming less energy. If we're putting water into the boiler at 105 degrees, compared to 85 degrees in a traditional hot well, well, we need to consume less energy to raise steam again. The steam tables tell us that. Uh, it also means uh, point four, well, there's gonna be less air and other non-condensable gases entrained within the water at a higher temperature compared to a lower temperature. Remember, the lower the water temperature, uh, the more gas there is contained within it, and that brings us on to point five. If we've got less oxygen and non-condensable gases in the water at a higher temperature, we need to add fewer chemicals to polish off that last remaining mass of gas. So that means not only have we got a cost saving by reducing those chemicals, it means point six, we need to perform far, far less blowdown of the boiler. If we're adding fewer chemicals into the boiler itself or into the deaerator, it means we need to purge less hot water away from the boiler to waste. Huge cost saving. But point seven that's quite often overlooked, it means that by elevating the water to a higher pressure, it means we can now contain a significant amount of those flash steam losses. We're simply bringing them away from the vents and we're bringing it back to the pressurized deaerator. We can now control, utilize those flash steam losses. And that really helps us to move towards a net zero loss system. And that's really because a small mass of condensate is, also, is always going to be lost in the flash steam. But by minimizing those losses, we can certainly move toward, towards that net loss system. And I mention moving towards it rather than achieving it because we are still going to experience a very, very small amount of energy loss or mass loss as a result of performing that essential blowdown that we've spoken about. So the pressurized deaerator is by no means a new technology, but it's one that's 
definitely too often overlooked. And it can certainly bring around an increase in energy efficiency and a reduction of heat losses, not just for um, traditional steam systems, but certainly when we're adopting all of those other uh, conceptual innovations that we've spoken about. So steam being vented away, regardless of whether it's plant steam or flash steam, it's an excellent telltale of a huge cost saving opportunity. Uh, and also where we're likely to experience a significant amount of emissions being, being lost to atmosphere. And this occurs whenever we've got either a failure of a steam trap or whenever we've got a significant pressure drop in the condensate. So sometimes it's a, a basic flash vessel can contain that energy. And um, whenever we're talking about a significant mass that's being lost, well, we might want to use a dedicated flash recovery skid. So whenever we've got huge volumes of flash steam potentially being vented away, typically indicative when we've got a process that's condensing the steam at high pressure. Well, the benefit here is that it will take not only the flash steam, but also the condensate on different sides of the heat exchanger and it can add that heat energy. So we're adding both the latent heat energy that's present in the flash and the sensible heat energy in the condensate to another process, to another heat sink. Now, even if we don't have another heat sink available locally to the process, wherever that pressure drop is taking place, wherever that flash steam is being produced, if we can get it back to the pressurized deaerator, or even if we can't, even if we don't have a pressurized deaerator, if we can get it back to that thermal store that we've spoken about, then we can use this flash steam to charge the, the vessel. And even if we've got flash steam escaping from the top of the condensate receiver, remember, we need to vent flash steam away at this point here in order to protect the pumps from cavitation and to protect any overpressure of condensate on the liquid side of the distribution network. Well, even if we fit a very simple exhaust vent condenser in the vent, it means that we can at least condense as much of the flash steam as we can before it escapes to atmosphere. And if we're condensing a significant amount of that flash steam, it means we're increasing the percentage of condensate return. It helps us to move towards that net zero loss system that we were speaking about. So I just want to summarize very quickly what we've gone through. First of all, the basics are always going to apply. We still need to remember the principles of good working practice when it comes to generating and distributing steam. That's where we're going to get a significant payback with very little cost or effort. And we also know that if we reduce the demand for steam at the process, then that's going to have a significant benefit. If we can reduce the heat loss by, in by increasing the grade of insulation, for example, then we're going to have a significant benefit. But moving towards modern and efficient innovation and new concepts when it comes to generating steam, well, we know that there's going to be a possibility in the very, very near future to move towards hydrogen burners. That doesn't necessarily mean replacing the steam boiler as a whole, just the burners whenever hydrogen is available locally. We also know that we may be in a position to replace a traditional fossil fuel fired steam boiler altogether and replace it with one of those electrical steam generators that we've spoken about. But we also know that we've also got the ability to utilize that thermal store to charge pressurized hot water from renewables and to distribute that to the process whenever there's a demand. We can also use that pressurized deaerator that we've spoken about to help move towards zero losses. And we can also digitalize the wider network so we can identify whenever there is a process or a distribution inefficiency that we can act on to bring about an increase in energy efficiency and also reduce those uh, carbon, uh, carbon emissions. So thank you very much for bearing with me during this evening's presentation. 
Um, that concludes number eight in our series of presentations that we've gone through over the last uh, over the last uh, few months. But on the success of uh, the feedback that we've received from this suite of presentations, we have actually been invited uh, to present the same suite again on behalf of uh, IMECE, starting towards the end of the month, right back at the beginning with STEAM system fundamentals. I think the key difference here is that the time of day that we've been asked to present at is 12 noon. So hopefully that will give some of you that have missed any one of these presentations the opportunity to dial in uh, and uh, attend them again. But please feel free to mention them to your, uh, to your colleagues or to anyone else that you feel may have a benefit from attending any of these presentations. And we'll also have the opportunity to record, uh, I think it was the first presentation and the seventh presentation in the suite, if I'm right, Brian. Yeah, I think that's right. Also We'll also have the opportunity to record these again uh, for the benefit of those of you that may want to revisit it for posterity. So we have got those training courses available down at our head office in Cheltenham for those of you that may be interested in taking your, uh, uh, your understanding of STEAM systems to the next level. I will be putting a LinkedIn post out um, either this evening or tomorrow uh, to promote the next tranche of presentations that we're doing for IMEC. So if you do see those, please feel free to share that to elevate it for the attention of a wider audience. And as previously, if you do have um, a, a requirement for a PDF of the slide pack we've gone through tonight or an attendance certificate, please send me a message on LinkedIn or send me a, a, an email and I'll make sure that that's forwarded to you. So on that note, I'd like to thank you, not just for attending tonight's presentation, but for attending the full suite of uh, presentations that we've gone through over the last month. And if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat function. And I'm sure Brian will read them out to me. But Brian, please be kind to me, because as I've mentioned, tonight's presentation is a conceptual presentation. They are new and emerging technologies. So uh, don't put me under the spotlight too much. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate it. Uh, not just for tonight, but for the uh, the previous seven as well. Uh, we have got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so the first one, um, Stephen asks uh, or states, ORC generators are usually very inefficient. How does the CPC concept compare to these? Are you in a position to answer that, Dan? Um. I've got a white paper that I'll kindly make available for you guys on the subject of the CPC. Um, it's a white paper we released um, a couple of months ago. Um, the short answer is it is more efficient than a, than a traditional ORC for the reason that it can utilize um, much lower temperatures. ORCs are typically only efficient at 120C plus. We can utilize energy, we can utilize the temperature of the waste at 70 degrees. Now, the thing to bear in mind here is we're not talking about um, a huge amount of electrical energy that is generated. Uh, the, the overall cost saving whenever we're utilizing a CPC needs to be uh, combined with the energy saving that is enjoyed by reducing the overall cooling costs as well if we're taking the energy and the temperature out of that waste stream. Uh, so more efficient than the ORC, but uh, just to manage your expectations here, don't go thinking that the CPC is um, a, a source of energy generation in its own right, because it isn't. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, next one's from Kyle. Uh, so if you, uh, this is... Um... Yeah, yeah. If you have one kilogram of water in a vessel at a pressure, uh, therefore assuring that no steam is generated, then I have one kilogram of steam at the same pressure, uh, but understanding at a greater, at a much greater volume. Do I have the same amount of energy in both? Um, wow. If I understand the question mm. correctly, uh, yes, it's just um, it's just a lowering of pressure. Um, that the point to make in mind, the point to bear in mind is we need to have enough thermal mass in the thermal store in order to satisfy the demand that is posed by the process. So it, it does need to be sized in accordance with the process requirements. Okay. And the pre it's the pressure drop 
that will determine the mass of steam that is generated to satisfy the process. Uh, next one from Stephen. Uh, are our, our Spyrax using AR stroke VR in the business today? How quickly do you, question, and how quickly do you think, if, if not already, uh, this will be widespread in its use? Well, it's very pertinent. It's very topical because uh, it was about eight, nine months ago that uh, Spyrax Arco globally, uh, we, we brought in a, a team specifically to look at this very issue. So it's, it's AR, VR, digitalization. We, we recognize that as, a, as a, an industry, um, we recognize that we've got a little bit of catching up to do. Um, but it's something that we, we we are determined to address in the uh, in the short term. This is where we recognise that there's going to be a significant number of opportunities where we can help our clients um, on site. We can help them with their challenges uh, in real time, and we can really help to really reduce the period of time between uh, an, an efficiency or a maintenance problem or a health and safety or a process issue uh, being realized and being rectified if we can shorten that gap then it's going to be to everyone's benefit great stuff thanks dan and the last one you, you'll definitely know this one um could you just tell us what role you uh, fulfill in spirax sarco the role i fulfill in spirax sarco my title is Consultant Specialist, uh, UK and Republic of Ireland. It's all very well and good. It sounds very fancy. Basically, that means um, I'm not a salesperson. It means I work um, essentially to educate uh, design engineers, uh, consultants, um, engineering procurement contractors, uh, facilities management companies, people that are designing steam systems, operating steam systems, installing steam systems, uh, and I work with them to offer them educational support, uh, technical support if it's required, and uh, commercial support if it's required. So I work alongside our sales teams. We've got uh, 28 uh, sales engineers that operate across the UK and Ireland, and a further four project support engineers. I work alongside them just to ensure that your requirements are really addressed think of me as trying to be an ambassador for steam as a whole rather than uh, trying to um, sell solutions to you that's great dan thanks i'll get i'll get a t-shirt printed with that on um it uh, looks like this is the last question um don't know whether you'll have any thoughts on this dan um how do you think the country will be able to provide the increased uh, electricity dem demand when gas and oil uh, uh, are not available. Uh, so not just <laughs> not just steam, but electric cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, I, I've gone through. I went through the government white paper that was released um, a couple of uh, a couple of months ago, and I was asking myself the same question. And um, the bottom line is, I don't really know. Yeah. I, I couldn't answer that. <laughs> well, I think there's going to be after. There's going to have to be a hell of a lot of investment in not only renewable energy and um, hydrogen infrastructure, for example, but I think we're also going to have to look at the way that we, we consume energy. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to um, look at both ends of the spectrum, energy generation, but also the way we distribute and the way that we uh, consume energy. We're going to have to look at it as a whole. Great stuff. Thanks. Very diplomatically answered there, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so without uh, without further ado, just a couple of very quick thank yous um, and then we'll close for the evening. So thanks, Dan, for all the efforts over the last eight lectures. It's been absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, please pass on uh, thanks to your colleagues at Spirex Star Sarko who are helping you to deliver this. Um, thanks to Nikki Baxter, uh, Yorkshire IMEC E. Uh, for doing all the back office stuff and thanks in advance to her who'll be dealing uh, for Nikki uh, dealing with all of the series two lectures where they'll get broader uh, marketing and would expect a significant uh, larger number of people connecting into it and thanks to project solutions uh, who uh, helped me uh, support the IMEC -E. and if anybody's interested in volunteering and getting involved uh, feel free to get in touch with me via LinkedIn or um, or you'd be able to contact us through the iMechie website. We always 